Okay, Mr. Marshall. We have Amherst Media here with us. You have a quorum. Uh, my computer says 633. We are recording and the attendees are coming on in. It looks like you're good to go to me. Okay, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the camp, to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 17th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Coldham. I'm here. Thank I'm you, here. Bruce. Tom Long. Present. Uh, Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. Karen Winter. Here. Uh, Andrew McDougall has told us he is unlikely to attend this evening, so Pam, if you notice the hit that he does arrive, help me remember what time that occurs. Yep. And I, Doug Marshall, am also present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so the time now is 637 and the first item on our agenda uh, uh, is approval of minutes. We have the minutes from April 19th available for uh, approval tonight as drafted by our uh, staff. So board members, any comments on the minutes? All right, I'm seeing a lot of heads shaking, no comments. So uh, would anybody like to make a motion to approve these minutes as drafted? Tom, you just beat out Johanna. <laughs> so moved. And Johanna. I second. Thank you both. Are there any, is there any more discussion from the board about these minutes? I do not see any. So we'll go right into our roll call. Bruce? I approve. All right. Tom? Aye. Uh, Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. We have six in favor, uh, one person absent. So the minutes are approved. 
All right, at this time, we'll move into our general public comment period. And so members of the public who are here, uh, this is when I usually read the names of the people I can see in the attendees list. We have Anna Devlin Gauthier, Dorothy Pam, Janet Keller, Jennifer Taub, Mandy Jo Haneke, Pam Rooney, Sam Gurin, and Tracy Zafian. Uh, it looks like we have a good representation from the town council tonight. All right, so uh, do any of the public attendees want to make a comment at this time about something that is not on our agenda? All right, I don't see any hands raised from the public, so we'll move right on. Uh, now at 639, we'll move to item three on our agenda. A public hearing regarding the zoning amendment. Okay, this hearing is continued from March 1st, April 5th, and April 19th, and May 3rd, all of this year. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. Well, I don't need to re read that again. Uh, this, this meeting is being conducted via remote means and is held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to heard, be heard regarding the zoning bylaw, Article 3, use regulations, Article 4, development methods, Article 9, non-conforming lots, uses, and structures, and Article 12, definitions. To see if the town will vote to amend Article 3, use regulations, to change the permitting requirements for owner-occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes, non-owner-occupied duplexes, convertible converted dwellings and townhouses to create more streamlined permitting pathways for these uses, to remove the use category subdividable dwellings, to add a use category three-family detached dwelling or triplex, to add a permitting pathway and standards and conditions for triplexes, to modify standards and conditions for other housing use categories, to amend permitting requirements for housing use categories in the Aquifer Recharge Protection Overlay District, to amend Article 4, Development Methods, to add three-family dwelling where appropriate, to amend Article 9, Non-Conforming Lots, Uses, and Structures, to add a reference to three-family dwelling, to amend Article 12, Definitions, to add three-family detached dwelling unit or triplex, and to delete subdividable dwellings. All right, so as I mentioned, this is uh, this is the fifth meeting at which we've had th this hearing. Uh, so it's we've had a fair amount of discussion on it. Uh, are there board board member board, board members, are there any disclosures any of you would like to make tonight re regarding this topic? Do not see any. All right. So uh, Pam, why don't we bring Mandy, Joe, and uh, Pat, if Pat's here, uh, over. I don't see her. So Mandy, welcome again. And uh, is there anything you would like to say this evening as introduction as we continue this hearing? Um, basically, so, so Pat will not be able to make it tonight. So um, I just wanted to let you know that. Um, we're just here to answer questions as you have, because it seems like you've moved into your deliberation phase. Um, and so I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much, Mandy. Okay, so board members, at the last meeting we focused on duplexes, although I know there were a couple of members absent at that discussion who are here tonight. Um, so we were going to move on to the other parts of the bylaw proposal, most first uh, onto the triplexes and then the other uh, types of houses uh, or residences. Bruce, I know you put together a uh, matrix with some questions. Do you want to talk to us about that or something else? I see your hand. Some, something else, Doug, I just wanted to ask you how you wanted to handle this uh, last time. Uh, we discussed the duplexes, but we didn't uh, move to uh, any further than the discussion because, as I recall, certainly 
Janet wasn't here, and I actually don't think uh, Andrew was either. Is it was it or was it uh, Tom? A anyway, what the question that I have is. I think it may have been both of them, you know, that all three of them were here. I'm not sure. But in any event, what I, I wondered with certainly with, with a, a, a more solid attendance tonight, I wondered whether you wanted to pick up on the duplex conversation. Uh, well, the question is, uh, do you want to do you want to ask to deliberate, uh, resolve and vote section by section uh, as to whether we support uh, this or do you, uh, it, which seems as though it might be a little easier in terms of keeping it fresh in our minds, or do you, or do, do you think we should do all of the deliberations and then uh, vote uh, either as a block or systematic uh, or sectionally? I, I just want to want to know what what you how you how you thinking of handling this. Well, um, since this was presented to us as a single package, and um, you know it went it went. It was sort of withdrawn and there was discussion with the planning department and then brought back and it's still a single package. Um, I, I guess I was expecting that we would do deliberation on all the parts and then eventually have a single up or down vote on the way it is. Um, I know in the duplex discussion, Bruce, there were some things you were interested in having in the bylaw or you know that were that are not there now um and i don't know if you're prepared with language you would want to add uh but you know i think we should vote it up or down and if there are amendments people want to make to make it at least more palatable to them uh entertain those as we go along and you know we could talk about amendments to duplexes now and then go into deliberation or about the other parts mm. but uh i guess to me, this is one vote because it stands as a single, single package. I think mm. pulling it apart is actually going to be difficult if we tried mm. to turn to do that. Well, I, I'd be happy to, as we go to craft a version of a motion, um, which I can send to you, um, uh, or at least uh, just keep track of it, so that uh, from my point of view, I I know what I'm supportive of. So of course doesn't mean that other people would support that but but I'm happy to do it that way right um, and I'll but I'll just keep track of my my thoughts as I go so far as support okay well, basically qualified support I think is where I'm at mm -hmm. okay Chris I see your hand yeah I didn't have the, I wasn't under the impression that you had finished your discussion about duplexes last time so my recommendation would be to go back and you know really complete your discussion about duplexes and then move on and i suggest using bruce's um, format or structure i sent you um a corrected version this afternoon because when i had edited it last week um some of the formatting had changed and i apologize to bruce and everyone else for that um but you do have a complete uh corrected version in your packet and i think that format is a really good uh, way to discuss this because it is it does have many parts to it and to take each part separately to discuss it I think is good and then however you want to um, vote on it if you want to vote on it as a package that probably makes sense but anyway I just wanted to say that I recommend that you go back and sort of recap your discussion about duplexes be comfortable with that and then move on step by step as Bruce has outlined thank you mm -hmm. So it did seem like uh, the way we were, you know, first talking about duplexes and then talking about the rest of it was in part, or in maybe in large part, to make sure everybody understood what it was, what the proposal was. Um, and then, uh, as Chris said, we didn't get very far into what people thought of it. Um, so, you know, uh, Janet, you missed that conversation. Um, and um, Tom, I, I forget, were you at the last meeting? I was, I was okay. at the last meeting. Sorry, sorry to not have a vivid memory of your conversation. That's all right, I missed the one before <laughs> that. And Andrew was missing last week. Okay, thank you. So um, I guess the first question is, how do, do people feel like they understand what in fact is being proposed? 
And are there, you know, the implications of it? Or do people want to talk more about that? Um, Janet, I see your hand. I I feel I could I could use a refresher about um, whatever the most recent version is, and I'm I'm a little confused about what happened with the design standards for duplexes. Is it keeping the ones um, from the design review board, or is it saying that the planning board might adopt them later and empowering them? Um, but I, I, I could use a quick refresher about the current proposal. Uh, and then highlighting adjustments. I think the current proposal is the same as the time, the last time you saw this, which was two times ago, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, was that April 19th? So if you read the minutes of April 19th, you probably have a pretty good idea. Um, so the proposal hasn't really changed. Um, and what else did I have to say? You know, I have some issues with um, owner occupied duplexes and how they can be permitted um, once they get to be more than two on a site. But um, I can I can hold that for later. But I don't think there have been any changes since then. And what was the second part of your question, Janet? Um, about the design review, is it are we oh, is it right. are we keeping this section three point two oh four design review, or is the the language about adopting it later, like empowering the planning department board to to adopt that later? Is that the current version? I think we're keeping the um, section three point two oh four. Okay. keeping that but then there was some concern about that being um primarily um related to downtown and village center uh development so um we said that the uh zoning board of appeals and the planning board would be authorized via this um bylaw amendment here to establish their own design guidelines that they would uh, incorporate into their rules and regulations um, but that hasn't happened yet and we did consult with our attorney at KP Law, and KP Law agreed with what Mandy Joe had said, which is that um, those two bodies really need to be authorized by the zoning uh, bylaw to create their design guidelines rather than just um, creating them without that authorization. So I think that was a dangling question the last time we reviewed this. So, so the amendment keeps. 3.204, but then the ZBA and the planning board can adopt different guidelines for whatever they're permitting? So um, they no, they would adopt guidelines that would be incorporated into their rules and regulations. And then every time they are reviewing um, a duplex, they would look at their guidelines and determine whether the proposal met those guidelines or not. Okay, so that could be two sets. Okay. I mean, that, okay, three sets. Okay. Uh, Janet, did you have any other uh, yeah. update questions at the moment? Oh, I had a comment about owner occupancy, but I'll wait until um, we have any more updates. Okay. All right. Um, so, Pam, I guess I'm wondering whether we should ask you to bring up the the highlighted bylaw changes on the on the screen. Okay, so this is the flow chart, but this is the actual bylaw. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Okay. And so, Bruce, on your uh, sort sort of organizing document, you know, the the three questions you had about duplexes were: Should owner occupied and affordable duplexes be allowed by right? in all five of the residential zones, should owner occupied and affordable duplexes be allowed by special permit in the aquifer recharge protection areas of RO, RLD, and RN, and should owner occupied duplexes be allowed by special permit of the zoning board in the three outlying 
residential zones, RO, RLD, and RN. Yes, that basically summarized what is being proposed by the proponents. Yeah. So, let's see, I'm seeing Chris's hand. So I think the way you read the last one, C, um, I think you left out the non-owner occupied aspect of that. So that question is, should non-owner occupied duplexes be allowed by special permit of the zoning board in the three outer lying residential zones? Oh, okay. right. Yes. Sorry. Sorry if I misread that. Yeah. Okay. Mandy Jo, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I think you're potentially reading from the, the wrong question sheet because non-owner occupied duplexes are already allowed by special permit in the RO, RLD, and RN zoning districts. What we are proposing to change is that they be allowed by special permit in the aquifer recharge protection areas of those three zones. Yes, I, I in the non-aquifer recharge protection areas, yeah. the current bylaw allows them by special permit. Okay, thank you, Mandy Jo. I thought I was reading the right one that came this afternoon. So. May I uh, interject for a minute? I think that was a um, that was a uh, something that I'm going to have to go back and look at all three versions of this chart. Um, Mandy Ooh. Joe is correct that non-owner occupied duplexes are already allowed in those zones by special permit. There have been three uh, people working on this document and editing it, and apparently um, the last change that Mandy Jo made and I accepted didn't get into this version, which is very confusing, and I'm sorry about that. So the yes. number C should read, non-owner occupied duplexes are allowed by special permit in this zoning district. And I think so. It <laughs> All right. So, so the, the, if you go, let me I just say this one more thing. I think if you go back to the version that you received in your packet, um, although the formatting isn't 100% correct, um, you can use your mind to um, renumber things and then the wording will be correct because that was the final version that I sent out. All the wording was correct. And um, only the numbering was incorrect. So uh -huh. if Pam can resurrect that. I version, can't. I can't. Well, no, I don't have that one. I, uh, I don't think. Uh, okay. But let's see, can we? Well, is it just a matter of changing the word B to R right here? If I may, Doug. Who is that? Mandy. It, Mandy, Mandy Joe, go ahead. You the are correct wrong. document is in the CRC packet for May. What are we? We're we're in it, the seventeenth for May eleventh. Okay. It could um, be up from there. Yeah. Do you have it, Mandy? I do. Would you mind sharing it? Oh, sure. I can do that. Give me a second. I mean, if 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 what I'm hearing is correct, doesn't it mean that the questions B and C are really essentially the same? Should any should any duplexes be allowed in the aquifer recharge district by special permit? I don't think number C refers to aquifer recharge. Okay, that's where and number C sort of goes away. Okay. I'm confused. Yeah. This is the correct version, I believe. Okay. I'm sorry, folks. I tried hard to make this simple. Do you, can I, Doug, can I ask a question? Uh, sure, Janet. 
So I'm actually just looking at the bylaw, um, like the um, use chart, and it looks to me that an owner-occupied duplex is SP for in the RO, but a no in the RLD. And that happens, that's the same for the non-owner-occupied duplex. And then affordable duplex is S SPR in the RO and SP in the RLD. Am I reading that correctly? Well, I, I guess I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering whether we'd be better off just bringing up the flow chart which shows what's it, what's what you're talking about, uh, Janet, with the changes that are proposed. The flow chart. Um, the the ch yeah the chart. Mandy Joe, I see your hand again. Yeah, Janet. Um, in the use chart, anything in parentheses refers to permitting requirements in this aquifer recharge protection district. Okay. So I think that's where your confusion is. The parentheses are not the RLD. The parentheses are all aquifer recharge protection district. Okay, one. thank you for that clarification. Yeah, so what I'm seeing um, on the flow chart, and you know, that's it is shown on this image that Pam has on the screen, is that owner occupied and affordable duplexes would go to being site plan review in the aquifer recharge district for the outlying zones, you know, and then the non-owners occupied would only be allowed by special permit in the aquifer recharge districts. Janet, I still see your hand. Are you still, uh, you got something else to say? I do have another question. So. So when you say, in a, so basically where you go to site plan review, there could be a house on that lot and then someone can build an affordable duplex or owner occupied duplex yeah. or just a non-owner. So there's three units on that lot and, and that could be either by site plan review, but not special permit. Just so, for these outlying districts or for aquifer recharge? Wherever, you know, wherever it switches, you know, I'm just, I'm just pointing out, like, we're talking about three units on the lot, potentially, not just well, in, if the in lot's lot. large <laughs> enough, you know, you could take the existing house and add a second unit to it, and then build another one. Yeah. Because, because one of the issues we've talked about is this idea that you can have more than one principal use on a site, if it's large enough. And so am I correct in saying that under this, I'm looking at a chart, is the owner-occupied duplex would be a yes in the RO and RLD, or is that like an old chart I'm looking at? No, that's correct. It would be a yes, except in the aquifer recharge district, which it would be a site plan review. So the owner-occupied duplex would just be going to the building commissioner. There'd be no that's planning. Correct. Okay. Okay. So that's, so. I have a comment about that, but I just. Well, why don't you go, go ahead and comment? So, so I I have concerns about like having three units built on a property in any of these districts without any notice to the abutters. And I, you know, I, I, I was thinking about my neighbors next door and I was thinking if they showed up one day with a duplex being put in and no one had talked to me or asked me about it, I would be concerned because part of the, you know, part of their um, lot is ledge, and are we have a really high groundwater table? So I would just think, oh, there goes my basement, right? And because um, there's not a lot of, we have really poor drainage here, and so I think the idea that you, your neighbor could put make, you know, a lot which is single family house or any empty lot, and put in like three units without any notice to abutters, and any input. And you know, good information, bad information, you know, this is, you know, whatever is really odd to me. And I think it would be really startling to a lot of people in Amherst in all these residential districts. And I think there's something very positive about public process, which is notice and ability to talk to the um the people making decisions. And then, you know, it's hard to appeal, but an ability to appeal. And so th that's one of my concerns. The second one is I had a friend who had an owner 
occupied duplex. It was required to be owner occupied, got a job in another city, couldn't sell her house to anybody. She couldn't get a buyer. And so I think she had to come back to the ZBA and spend at least $5,000 to get that requirement lifted. And then, you know, and there were, there were different conditions put on the house because there was like a big attic and no one could stay in the attic and someone, you know, whatever. And I just think there's not really a huge market. And I wouldn't want to impede people's ability to sell their house, like it, it, an owner occupied triplex or a duplex. And I think what you're trying to get at with requiring owner occupancy is more stable neighborhoods, hopefully, you know, well man manicured yards or well maintained yards. And also somebody supervising the renters and with the idea that your renters, be they students or non-students, will be much more chill and um, than if there was no one there at all. And I think we could point to, in our town, probably hundreds of examples of, you know, duplexes and triplexes and multifamily houses without proper supervision and, and the negative impact they have. And so I don't, I'm not so crazy about owner occupancy because I think it puts a lot of burden on people to sell to another owner occupant and that market may not exist. And then at the same time, I think that what we're really trying to get at with the requirement of owner occupancy is more stable neighborhoods. And you know, the, you know, the, the proponents of these changes are trying to create space for non-students, you know, affordable space for families and you know, working class people to live in our neighborhoods and have a nice mix of different types of people, different types of economics. And so I wonder, I don't know if, the, I don't really like the owner occupancy requirement. I wonder if there's a way to get to what we look for without saying no public process, no notice to abutters or neighbors, and also, um, you know, putting in requirements that might be really difficult for people when they try to sell. Okay, so it sounds like you would support having either site plan review or special permit in all cases. And you are not enthused about making owner occupied duplexes more easier to build. Yeah, and I think then I think the affordable duplex to me that just means habitat for humanity, right? You know, those are the habitat houses or they're built by um, you know, the different um, CDC kind of groups. And I think that's fine for the building commissioner because you know, I think that's, make that easier and you know, whatever. But I do think um, that I wouldn't thinking more of like one duplex on a lot, not just like three units sort of showing up. So, so those are I mean, you're, you're worried about your neighbor. So if, if your neighbor sells to Habitat for Humanity and they put up another duplex, you're fine with that? Well, actually, as I was saying, and I realized, oh, there's a three unit problem. So I think once you get over a certain amount, like to me, like, I think it's like the issue for all of these things is how many units are on a lot and what does it look like? I would rather see, you know, if there's three units on a lot that it'd be in one building, right? Not, you know, a duplex in, you know, whatever, or two, you know, a series of duplexes versus, you know, so I just think we're really talking about is how do we regulate and how do we permit multifamily houses? And I think we need consistency in that and not getting so caught up in, you know, is it a duplex? Is it a triplex? Is it a townhouse um, kind of thing? But, but I'm okay. not sure, you know, I, I know we're kind of like wending our way through this sort of complicated thing and making adjustments. But I, I think to me, it's like, let's step back and just look at what our goals are in the regulations. Well, I mean, we are talking about it in detail. Um, you know, we we could decide that there's so many changes we want to make, we they should just start over. Okay, Mandy Joe, I see your hand. You probably want to respond to some of that. Um, actually, I just want to clarify something because when you only look at the chart, you're missing a lot of the proposal if you're just looking at the permit use categories and the yes SPR SP. Um, so for those owner occupied duplexes, the conditions say that if you get over two units, one building, Janet, um, in the ROLD, you would need a special permit. Um, so once you add that third unit, you wouldn't be a building commissioner review, you would have a special permit. In the RN, RVC, and RG, the conditions that we've proposed say once you get to that third unit, you would need a site plan review. 
again, not building commissioner approval. Um, so once you've added more than that one building, those two units, you're you're to the public hearing stage, whether you're at the ZBA or the planning board, it depends on what zoning district you're in, but but you're at that public hearing, you'd have a butters notices, you would have all of that. So that's the same for affordable duplexes too. So so the proposal, so so looking at the chart, I just want to say looking at the chart doesn't tell the whole story. If you're just looking at the whole chart, you have to consider the conditions too. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification, Mandy Joe. Good, good, good point. Uh, Bruce. Um, Doug, I was going to say the same thing, um, uh, that uh, this uh, this proposal has been morphing uh, progressively, so that's another dimension of complexity uh, that we have to deal with. Um, the staff had made recommendations, and apparently Mandy Jo and Pat have uh, absorbed them, so uh, so, so uh, that makes a big difference for me. Uh, secondly, and the reason why I, I guess I'm speaking here now is that um, I think it's it's quite possible that uh, some people will uh, build duplex uh, owner occupied duplexes and maybe regret them. But I I know that there's a lot of others that or there are others that won't. Um, our community here has been uh, created using uh, owner occupied uh, duplexes, and uh, it would be very nice for us to have had this uh, ability uh, 30 years ago especially with the uh, with the, uh, the, the the added uh, uh, conditions and so forth requirements associated with allowing the building commissioner to say yes to uh, owner occupied duplexes as long as they don't uh, as long as only one of one duplex on, on on a site and the same with affordable duplexes and um, and if somebody has shares Janet concern that they won't be able to sell their own or occupied duplex, well, then uh, let them have a shot at uh, going through this, uh, the zoning board and getting approval for a, um, a non-owner occupied duplex. Meanwhile, let's not make it difficult or more difficult for uh, uh, people who do want to create owner occupied duplexes because they may not be a strong market for it. But I think it's worth preserving the opportunity. So basically, this uh, structure that's emerging here, uh, I've moved from uh, being skeptical at the uh, beginning um, to feeling that um, this is broadly supportable. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Johanna. Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, and thank you, Mandy Joe. And it's been a good discussion. Um, I, so while I appreciate that this is one package, my thoughts were that it would be helpful to almost like straw poll the different elements of it. Um, and Bruce has kind of gotten us down that path already by saying how he's feeling about the duplexes provision. Um, I'll just, I guess, share my thoughts in kind of the spirit of getting a little bit of that straw poll moving in hopes that we can then move on from duplexes to the rest of the discussion and the proposal. Um, so I'll just say, I think the evolution of this and the morphing is good. <laughs> um, you know, it means the input is getting incorporated. Um, I think these changes are good. Um, we need housing in town. Owner occupied is something people, you know, the town is familiar with. Um, this places a premium on affordable housing, and then it just provides the nudge, right? It's not radical. This is not a radical shift. It just nudges so that we can generate more more duplexes in town um, by streamlining the permitting. This streamlines it in ways that I think our community like supports. Um, it's not going to be the solution to our housing problems, right? I think last meeting we talked that this might generate 200 extra units. I think there's potential for those to be workforce housing. So at this point, I think um, I'm excited about this. I think, um, you know, if it was just this provision, I would be a yes vote. And I'm interested in hearing other people's thoughts and then talking about triplexes and the other pieces so that we can move it along. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Johanna. Janet. So, you know, workforce housing. So <clears throat> when I look at the numbers of how much it would cost to build like a duplex, like 
you know, I used the $250 per square foot, which um, Rob Moore, he had suggested between 225 to 275. So I took the middle and I figured the duplex has 3000 square feet, like 1500 square feet, which is not a big house by current standards. And then I, I buy a lot and I come at it like at least $900,000. And so is that affordable workplace, workforce housing? And so, I, and it's not just, you know, saying about the duplex, but I think it's, you know, I think the triplex is actually worse because the triplex requires um, a sprinkler system under mass law. You know, it's like an apartment and and then you'd add like 50 or more, thousand or more, maybe a hundred to that system. And so I just, I just think in a way, like our goals are laudable, but I don't know how we get there given the current market. And, you know, if, if the, so, I, you know, I don't know if we're going to, I'm not against duplexes, but I'm just wondering, like, are we going to get there with this kind of housing? And, you know, we're thinking it's, people are going to build it, but if it's, if a duplex, a triplex, like came out with like at almost $1.25 million, you know, before we even got to, you know, it's just, it's just a crazy number. And I just wondered, will we oh. get there? And ha have the proponents looked at the cost of building these things plus land and, and things like that? Uh, Janet, Janet, it's not really our job to make this, to make the numbers work. Um, you know, it's our goal, the, right? The, the assumption that it's like 1500 square foot unit is, you know, that may be excessive. That's almost, that's larger than the house I live in. Um, so, you know, these could be, 700 square feet, uh, one bedrooms, you know, maybe, or two bedrooms, but uh, there's, there's no, you know, it's the developer's job to figure out how to make the numbers work. And ours is to allow or not allow end results that we are either comfortable with or not. I, so I, I'm less concerned about that. You know, it could be a three, three, a triplex with one large, um, you know, owner occupied unit and then two small units. We don't know. Mandy Joe, you're still muted. Apologize. I'll have to fix that on my headphones. Um, I just wanted to point out that that if you divide that 900,000 in half, um, that's cheaper than the median sale price in Amherst right now. Um, and if you divide the 1.25 in three, that's cheaper than the median sale price in Amherst right now for single family homes. Um, so while they might not qualify for big A affordable, um, they would potentially, even in your calculations, Janet, add um, housing that is below our median sale price, uh, collectively below, right? <laughs> There's always a difference depending on how it, it's worked, whether it's condoed or not, but collectively below the median single family home sale price in Amherst right now. All right, thanks to Mandy Joe. Um, Chris, uh, you had earlier mentioned that you maybe had some things you wanted to say about this part of the proposal. Yeah, I'm. Um, my hang up is that um, if you build more than two duplexes on a property, so so four um, units four units then um you know my opinion is that you should do that by a special permit not by site plan review because i say i think site plan review is is great but it um you can't say no unless um the applicant doesn't provide the required information or somehow deviates from the zoning bylaw so you kind of are you know inclined strongly inclined to say yes and there's no um, appeal process so for more than um, two duplexes on a property i would recommend a special permit and that's what i've written in my memo mm -hmm. um, to you okay so board uh, members we can take that uh, suggestion recommendation under under advisement as we're thinking about things we might want to amend in this in this proposal. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. 
Yes, uh, I think I'm guilty uh, of thinking I didn't lead to download, uh, Chris, your uh, May 3rd version of the May 2nd. Uh, so when I, uh, what I read and it was that you were, look, you were advocating uh, site plan review for two between three and four and for special permits for more than four. But do I now correctly understand that you've simply got a one liner there that is anything more than two is uh, you, the, the staff are recommending uh, um, special permit? No, I'm what I said is um, I could support one duplex on a property by uh, yes and yep. um, a permit from the building commissioner. Two duplexes on a property, I would recommend site plan review with the planning board because that would mean four dwelling units on a property. And then over four dwelling units on a property, I would recommend a special permit because I think that's really um, a, a strong move towards densification. And okay, that's consistent with the memo I have in front of me, but I heard differently a moment ago, so I'm glad I asked. I may have said the wrong words, but that's the second thing is what I meant to say. Okay, okay. I'm good. Thank you, Bruce. Janet, I see your hand. So, um, you know, when I think about having four, du you know, two duplexes next door to me or in the um, different residential neighborhoods, what I think about is students. And so we know the market, the people who are paying the most for rents generally are students and that, um, you know, when I gave those numbers before, a developer actually wants to make a profit on what they're building, right? And so, um, and then somebody who's building, you know, even a, you know, say a homeowner builds a duplex, they're going to want high rents. You know, it's it's a lot to pay to build a unit at 350000 and then pay taxes on that. You're going to want high rents. And we know we're in a market where the highest rents are being paid by students. And so nothing in this proposal addresses the issues of student housing. And so I would you know, caution that we, you know, loosening requirements without actually some kind of mechanism to make sure that these neighborhoods are kept intact, adding students, but not an influx of students, or some mechanism like the way that Bruce is looking at to make sure neighborhoods aren't flooded by student housing, because we've seen that as a very negative impact on a lot of neighborhoods. We've heard a lot of neighbors talk about that, including people who work at UMass. And so, I would say special permit for three P three units. I would say special permit for four because we have to have some kind of way of making sure, not just by management plans, but you have two dupl you know, you have four units, and each has four students. Um, just do the numbers and do the cars and do the um, impact on neighborhoods. And there seems to be under site plan review no real way to regulate that. And I think until we get a handle on protecting neighborhoods or making sure that it's um, a mixed population, I don't think we should go forward with this with, you know, fewer requirements, permitting requirements. Okay. And I know the proponents don't see this as a problem, the student housing problem. I just think everybody else does. And we've heard a lot about it. All right. Thanks, Janet. Um, Karen, you're next. Yes. So uh, working on the local historical commission and on this, I, you know, I, I have seen developers come and, and ask for special permits and then the working together with the board and listening to the uh, abutters has really improved the outcome. And I think we do want densification, but we haven't got all those design re uh, review things in place. We want to be careful that we, we want more densification, but we don't want to destroy a neighborhood by uh, loosening regulations to the point that something sort of unsightly and that just is a jar to the abutters gets built. So I, I'm also, I agree that loosening requirements, I don't see the benefits that much. I don't think that it's really um become a problem for people that see a, a new lot and say they want to build something on it they want to provide a lot of housing like Barry Roberts did on Sunset and they make a proposal and then together with the neighbors who live there listening to their concerns 
redesigns it and is kind of grateful for the input, puts the driveway somewhere else and you get a much better outcome. I think we have a small town. It's a very beautiful town. It's a very special town. And we don't want to just loosen under this sort of idea that, okay, that's going to make more people build faster and it'll be more, there'll be more housing. It'll be more affordable. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we have to um, have a lot of plans and a lot of people working together. And I, I think I've heard Chris say that she she's not aware of someone who's really stopped doing what they want to do um, because of this special permit process. I do agree. I think I think the way of the future is to probably build duplexes and triplexes and co-housing, and that's a good thing. But we need to have the input and we need to have regulations and not just do away with them, I think. So Karen, are there uh, specific changes you support to this proposal or do you just not support this proposal? No, I would go along with, I, I agree with Chris. I think that um, the conditions that she has uh, with having a duplex, you know, one on a unit, that that's, that seems, something that I would, I, I would support it in the way that Chris formulated it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bruce, you are next. Um, Janet, I just want to make sure that you understand that the, that the way Chris formulated it uh, the, and is that uh, the, uh, the proposal that we, we, we allow a duplex by right and that between two and the second duplex would be by site pan review and the third duplex by special uh, uh, per, third, third and any more by special permit those are all applied to owner occupied duplexes so the student component of that the control of the student component of that i'm fairly comfortable is going to be um uh, conducted by the owner occupancy uh it's uh if there was no owner there, then it would it would they would all require a special permit, and that's no change from the way it is at present. So basically, what we're talking about is relaxing in the way that is being discussed, uh, proposed by the proponents, and with the uh, accepted uh, um, qualifications uh, from the planning staff, applies to owner occupied duplexes, and I think that's fine. It seems to me that we're reasonably safe. And it does make it easier for those few people who want to do owner occupied duplexes. Um, and those folks, and there's numbers of them who think, well, yes, uh, we can we can take student renters or we can take uh, non-student renters. We can take any renters we like into that, or we can take family, um, or we can take friends or, um, but the, uh, the risks to the neighborhood, I think, are, um, greatly diminished by the requirement that these are owner-occupied duplexes we're talking about, not non-owner-occupied. Non-owner-occupied duplexes essentially is unchanged, except that we're proposing, that it is proposed to allow them by special permit in the outer districts, but they're already allowed by special permit in the, in the inner districts and the village centers. So there's not a great deal of change there. Um, the big change is with these owner-occupied duplexes, but because they're owner-occupied and the way that they've been qualified by planning staff's intervention, I think uh, makes them acceptable. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Tom. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I think just, you know, I'm, I made this comment before about um, sort of master plan and how one might plan density. I think also in light of, um, concerns for how we develop um, and an impact on the environment. Um, and based on the fact that, um, as Chris said, an, an SPR is essentially a yes with conditions, um, the idea that you could put four dwellings onto any property in Amherst, any residential property in Amherst, and the amount of parking and permeable surfaces that you have to add, and the amount of impact it would have on the land to put four, four dwellings on every property. I'm not saying that's going to happen, 
but that doesn't seem like a reasonable way to approach the land in Amherst and to build density. And it doesn't seem like an environmentally friendly way to do that. And I don't think I could support even just the duplexes based on those conditions. So I would be a nay on this, just to give you my perspective on it, um, just on you know duplexes alone um, before we get into some of these larger ones, which, which I'm actually more okay with in certain zones, seeing more density in certain areas. Um, I'm less interested in seeing parking lots and four dwellings in all residential zones. That doesn't doesn't feel like the right thing to do from an environmental or a master plan perspective. Okay, thanks, Tom. Janet, Janet, you are muted. Chris, do you have numbers on how many um, owner occupied duplexes we have in Amherst, and then? like a rough idea of like how many owner occupies were converted to non-owner occupied? Like so in the last we, 10 we or had, 20 years? We had the numbers at the last meeting for how many duplexes there were and how many were probably owner occupied, I thought. I don't have that? those numbers right at hand, but I think you did have them at the last meeting in the packet for the um, yeah. May, what was it, May 3rd? Yeah, the packet for the last meeting had those, Janet. Okay. Um, the other the other issue, and this is doesn't just apply to duplexes, but in the RG, um, you can build with footnote M, you can build nine units per acre, but the um, footnote M does not cover triplexes and it does not cover duplexes. And so if you were building a series of duplexes or triplexes, you would go from nine units per acre, which I think we can all admit is pretty dense, and you would go up to 11 units per acre. And so I don't think we want that, but I think, so I think if we, we should think about the RG as sort of a special area because obviously it's kind of a target for infill, but I don't think it should be a target like that because 11 units per acre is pretty dense and it could be a series of triplexes and duplexes kind of getting around the purposes and intent of footnote M. And I hate talking about footnote M because it's so complicated, but um, here we are again. <laughs> Chris is smiling at least. Okay, thanks, Janet. Johanna. Thanks. Um, I just want to acknowledge, I, I total, so I hear Janet's point about a butter engagement and people feeling like they have a, I don't know, a right to know what's happening in their neighborhood at the same time. Um, you know, property laws are property laws and, um, and longer process can make it harder to generate this kind of housing we know that that's it's kind of a like a lot of the things are kind of tried and true nimby tactics that have been used over the years to stop housing generation so i just want to acknowledge that tension that we that we face um the and then tom's point i agree that our mass that ideally this isn't how we this would not be our growth strategy as a town um our growth strategy according to the master plan should be growing in the town center and in the village centers. And I would argue the town center is probably where that should be directed. So, um, you know, and yet we might need a little bit of both. So um, that's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, like, I think this is a subtle nudge that streamlines housing generation in ways that I think Amherst can support but it's not the big move that's actually going to, you know, diversify the tax base, add vibrancy, um, make our community more walkable and bikeable. This isn't that play. This is like a, you know, a much more subtle nudge from my standpoint. Okay, thanks, Johanna. Um, so I will offer one comment, which is that I'm generally not in support of more development over our aquifer recharge area. You know, I, if I have a house and I put a fuel oil tank in it and it leaks, it's going to potentially end up in the aquifer. If I have an old car and my gasoline tank leaks, 
you know, I don't know how far that'll go. And maybe it doesn't really travel very far and you can excavate all the soil that's contaminated and truck it off to Ohio or something. But uh, in general, I would say we don't want to have more development over an area that support that's providing drinking water. Um, so I have a hard time with any provision that increases the uh, number of houses and vehicles and you know household cleansers that are going to be over an aquifer area. So I have a hard time with that. Um, I, at the last meeting, I was pretty clear, and I think I uh, pretty much the same as Tom just expressed about this is not the way I would try to solve the housing problem. And um, you know, I, I I just I have a hard time with this. I think the only reason I could support this is if I think it isn't really going to do much. <laughs> um, so. I'll stop there. Uh, did I kill all the hands that were raised or did we just run out of things to say? Okay, maybe we're kind of running out of steam on the duplexes. So maybe we should move on and talk a little bit about triplexes. And um, Bruce, maybe, we, or, you know, Pam, why don't you bring up Bruce's questions for triplexes? I certainly could just read what I see uh, in the package, the, the document that came this afternoon. It was, should we bother to create a triplex use category, which is currently only achievable as a subdividable dwelling or a small townhouse? And it looks like that's pretty much the way it looks. Uh, Bruce, why don't you give us some comments? Yeah, maybe I should have said is, which is currently achievable. In other words, it's already possible to be done by either of those two current options. So the only word, another, uh, another editorial strike there. But um, the reason for asking this question first before we proceed seems to me to be that we should understand that the triplex falls outside the regular street jurisdiction of the one and two family building code and goes therefore into the mass, the general uh, Massachusetts building codes. Um, it seems to me that folks who are building triplexes would probably be the same people who are building one and two family housing. And it seems to me that if they had to use had to become familiar with a, a vastly expanded building code in, in order to uh, uh, do that. And I'm not even sure that their um, construction supervisor's license would extend to that. I, that I do not know. But it did seem to me that, uh, that, that the incentive to do these would be rather small because it seemed to me that it was questionable as to whether the smaller one and two family contractors would move up to this. Uh, and if they did, uh, why wouldn't they move to townhouses or larger buildings? It's, it just seemed to me to be a, 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 a category that we are creating that would likely be um, uh, not used largely for that reason. And maybe well, I should is ask. There, uh, is there uh, harm in creating a category that we hope will be, re be used? And, and, and see if someone takes us up on the offer? I suppose it's fine. It seems to me that it's unlikely, um, but uh, especially since we have these other two mechanisms for doing it. Okay. Chris, you're next. Yeah, so I wanted to point out, again, this is um, not the latest version of this document. <laughs> um, and triplexes are also allowed in addition to subdividable dwellings. They're allowed as converted dwellings. They're allowed as small townhouses and they're allowed as um, small apartments. So there are a number of mechanisms for getting to a triplex currently. Um, but the idea here was that we would take triplexes out and make them 
um, potentially easier, although I think that in the end we um, didn't necessarily change the permitting path. But in any event, I just wanted to point out that there are at least four ways of getting to a triplex now. And okay. that is reflected in the document that came with your packet, even though it was formatted incorrectly. Thank you. Okay. So under the flow chart, I'm seeing the triplexes allowed by special permit now or under the proposal in the BN, in the RG and the RVC, in the RN, by all of that by special permit, and then still not allowed at all in the outlying RO and RLD districts. Uh, Bruce, your, your hand is still up. Are you? Uh, no, it's a legacy. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. And Chris, your hand is up. Are you done? You're muted. All right, that, Janet, we're over to you. So I, I found this adding the triplexes like you know, I actually had hopes when we were, I, I find this whole um, multi-family housing section of the bylaw to be incredibly confusing and really detailed. And I had sort of hopes that we would, the reforms would be making it easier for people to understand and kind of navigate it. And so I think to me, when I read about subdividable dwellings and converted dwellings, I'm like, well, those are triplexes. And there's all sorts of um, kind of guardrails or protections within that. Um, about, you know, if you're in the RL or RO, you have to add X amount of extra square footage or the RN, something else, um, some owner occupancy requirements. So I, I, I don't want to add another category. I mean, like if you rename subdividable dwellings and just put slash triplex, then you could just, I don't know why we would abandon subdividable dwellings. Um, it, maybe we can just notify people this is a triplex. <laughs> But if we if we take a moment and look at the bylaw, there's a lot of good requirements in the in the subdividable. Sorry about this kitten. Um, subdividable dwelling. Um, I, I I don't know if I can continue seriously here. Just a second. Um, so I I think we should keep those protections. Um, and there's some limitations about where they can be. And so I I kind of don't understand why we're adding another way to go to three when we already have like three ways to go to three. And maybe subdividable dwellings just has a bad name. Um, but I think we need to, if we're going to talk about adding a triplex, but we're adding triplexes with much less protections than we have for converted dwellings and subdividable dwellings. And I'm not sure why. I think we should you know, add those or just rename subdividable dwellings into triplexes to notify people who may not know. OK. Thank you, Janet. I will, I will, I guess, repeat, it looks to me like every triplex is subject to a special permit. So we as a town can always say no. We are essentially unlimited in the number of uh, conditions or requirements we would put on those. Now, we don't have the language that's been in the bylaw for subdividable dwellings, but there's no reason the zoning board couldn't uh, Keep the, that language, you know, in their in their back pocket, and just pull it out whenever they're thinking about triplexes. Bruce, I, I would recommend also as a qualification, if it's not already in the notes and so forth, that we add the uh, the provisos for uh, additional triplex units on a given lot. Um, well, actually, I suppose it doesn't matter, does it? Because we're they're all special permit anyway, so uh, um, I take uh, I'll stop talking. What I was <laughs> saying is irrelevant. Sorry, <laughs> not a problem, Bruce. Uh, Janet, we're back to you. So I think if we want, I mean, you know, there is a reason for these protections in subdividable dwellings and converted dwellings, and um, I'm not sure about townhouses. It's not my area very well. I don't know why we would add a fourth category of three buildings and say, oh, well, if you want to, you can add these more restrictive ones, like keeping, making sure they are public ways. You know, I mean, if you, if I think we should take a minute and look at all the language that is X'd out in subdividable dwellings and the language that is X'd out, because that's what we're losing. And if we, we think, if we don't think that is important language 
and we could easily lose it, um, then we should just come out and say that, you know, like, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, let's just look at the the conditions, like what we would lose, because people are obviously going to go to a triplex where it's there's fewer requirements. The planning board or the ZBA is going to say, well, okay, this is a triplex. It's not a subdividable dwelling. You know, we can we can freestyle here and make up conditions, or we could apply these other ones. I just I just think it's just a weird extra complexity for what we already have. Again, in the RG, we can now have three triplexes and a duplex. I think that's we get to 11 units. And then we're getting to really what we um, town meeting really went against and a lot of um, neighbors of the RG went against, which is um, the development that is, Chris, what is the name of the development? It's, I think it's on High Street. Um, it's by Salem Place. Mr. Um, Robleski owns it. Spruce, Spruce Ridge. So that's that's the density of 11 units on an acre in the RG. And so if we allow triplexes, footnote M will not apply. And, you know, here we are again. So I think I think we need some consistency and simplicity. And so multifamily housing has similar requirements, similar guardrails, um, similar per permitting pathways. It just seems this is getting needlessly complicated and not really protecting the neighbors. Okay, so it sounds like this is another reason that you would not support the, the proposal. I think, um, I think we can get there better in an easier way. Okay, I will say that running on my regular running route past Spruce Ridge, it seems pretty benign to me. It doesn't seem like a huge, you know, uh, injury to the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, they felt that way. That's why they went to town meeting. You mean the original people that live there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I, I assume people are now used to it, and maybe that's why it doesn't strike me as a problem. All right, Bruce, is your hand a legacy, or are you back? It's a legacy, I'm sorry. All right, Chris. So I just wanted to point out that um, converted dwelling as it exists right now is really complicated and really cumbersome, and it only applies to existing buildings. So you can't build a converted dwelling. You have to have an existing building that you convert into something else. So it's not really um, a good substitute for something that could be a triplex. And so that's why a long time ago, the planning department had proposed um, a new category that would be a triplex. So we're in support of this proposal here, and we don't think that a converted dwelling would take its place. Thank you. Okay, great. And I, I'd, I'd say that I'm actually fairly supportive of this uh, to add the triplexes and get rid of the subdividable dwelling category. Uh, the only thing I would do would be to keep uh, triplexes as a no in the RN when we're in the aquifer recharge district. Chris, I assume that's a legacy hand. Oh, sorry, yes, I will, sorry. I yeah. will drop your hand. Drop okay. Um, all right. So, uh, anything, any other board members want to say about triplexes before we move on? Johanna. I'd say I too am supportive of this. And then Doug, I like, I think your points about protecting the drinking water supply and not exposing it to any new additional risks from human development make a lot of sense to me. So I don't quite know what that amendment language could or should be or how best to weave it in. But um, yeah, I just want to say. Well, I, I, I would probably do some a few more no's <laughs> in the aquifer recharge district. <laughs> right. Maybe that's more, you know, I don't I don't want to be telling people what heating heating system they can use or whether they can only have an electric car and if they live there. Um, so yep. I just say develop somewhere else. All right. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, Bruce. Um, 
Doug, I agree with you. I think there should be a parenthesis N in the RN column where there is also an SP for triplex. So I, I think I, I support that too. I would support that as a change. And if Manny Joe agrees, it would go into this chart and then it would be supportable without having a, a, it qualified in a, in a motion. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Bruce. And Janet. Um, I wanted to add to your comments about the water recharge area, aquifer recharge area. A lot of the reason to have light development there is, is for recharge. And so the more hardscape that you have, the less likely the groundwater is going to, you know, resupply. And so more driveways, more hardscape, more buildings, um, you know, there's more runoff, there's more erosion, it's less, less land to absorb the water. Um, so I was wondering if we could look at the subdividable dwellings and the requirements and see if we want to bring some over to the triplex. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Well, uh, do you want to read them or do you want me to read them? I know you're not feeling well. Thank you. I'd, I'd love you to read them. All right. Let me see. OK. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to mention that it's now about 10 of 8. And we normally take a break around 8. And uh, Chris has mentioned that one of the applicants for our old business, bringing back some of the tent structures, uh, would prefer to, that we address uh, their topic earlier in the evening rather than however long we're going to go with this topic. Mm. So at, at around eight, I think uh, I'd like us to take a break and then we'll move to the old business, uh, the, the two topics about the tent structures that we allowed during COVID. And then we'll come back to this after that's finished. If, if anybody objects to that, please let, let me know. Um, you can raise your hand at any time in the next 10 minutes. And Janet, we probably won't get through all of these in 10 minutes, but we can start now. Okay. All right, so the first one says, a subdividable dwelling shall contain provisions for a specified number of dwelling units, not to exceed three, in accordance with a special permit issued prior to its use as more than a single family dwelling. The total number of dwelling units at any given time may be fewer than but shall never exceed the maximum number allowed under the special permit. So Chris, I'm gonna ask you to explain what that means. <laughs> I think you shouldn't be, pardon me for being uh, straightforward, I guess, <laughs> but I think you shouldn't be reading the subdividable dwelling because that's one that people are thinking of removing completely. And you might want to read com um, converted dwelling, which is what um, Janet referred to initially in her comment. That would be oh, okay. a Did, recommendation. I'm on the wrong one. I'm sorry. I think so. And I think you might want to read the original converted dwelling, which is on page, what page is this? 30 of the zoning bylaw as the, as the text that I believe Janet is feeling like she wants to um, use rather okay. than the amended converted dwelling, which takes out a lot of the things that um, are, are in there. Okay, sorry about that. Well, I was hoping to read it off of our handout. So, I can okay. read it. Do you want me to read it? There we go. Oh, okay. So converted converted dwelling. An existing residence, a structure attached to an existing residence, or a detached structure may be converted into a dwelling unit or units provided all other zoning requirements which would apply to converted dwellings are met. Uh, Janet, uh, I'm assuming that that language is not something you would feel strongly about keeping. Or uh, you are muted. 
Um, it's a, it's a, I assume the triplex is a new building, right? Or am I making that? Yeah, uh, generally, yeah. It could be either one. Triplex doesn't have to be a new building. So this, this, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely keep this. Okay. But I mean, they're sort of reinforcing my point that we already have like that kind of triplex, but go ahead. Well, this is for an existing building rather than what might be built as a new building under the triplex category. I, th I think what I was trying to say is in the subdividable dwellings, there's a requirement that the new building be mutually compatible with the neighborhood. There's a requirement of a landscaping plan. There's a requirement of a management plan. In the RN, for the extra units, you have to give another thousand square feet. In the RO or RLD, there's 2,000 square feet. So all those kind of protections that would reduce density are gone with the triplex. And so that's what I was trying to say is that we're losing something by going to the, the triplex. Um, Excuse me, may I just say something? Wait, Janet, wait. Janet referred to the subdividable dwelling again, and I don't think that's what she meant to refer to. I think she meant to refer to converted dwelling. Subdividable dwelling is kind of an odd duck. It's something that can go back and forth between one or three dwelling units, and it's only been used once. And so um, it's being proposed to be taken out of the bylaw completely, whereas converted dwelling is proposed to stay in the bylaw and be modified. Well, and I think what Janet is referring to is the things that she thinks are good about the converted dwelling. I could be wrong about that. Maybe I'll just stop and I won't say anything else, but I thought that's what she was well, getting at. I'm actually saying, yeah. I think you are mistaken because the language that she's mentioning here, I see under subdividable dwelling, but I don't see it under converted dwelling. Although, yeah, but under convertible converted dwelling items 11 and 12, that's a landscape plan and that's has the minimum uh, square feet of usable open space of 2000 or 1000. So, so I think it, it looks like it appears in both places. So maybe to save time, since we only have 10 minutes, I actually would like to take the, the good language from both converted dwellings and subdividable dwellings and apply them to triplexes, because there's other language in converted dwellings talking about location and things like that. But maybe we can, for the next meeting, just have a summary of these protective provisions, because there is a lot of text here for you to read. And we every single sentence doesn't really contain that. So maybe we should save that for next time. Well, do you think you would be up for coming back to the next meeting with some with with the parts that you'd like applied to triple? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I have an open copy of the bylaw, so that would be easy to lift. So that'd be I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Mandy Joe. Yeah, um, I just don't want the committee to forget that there are many conditions proposed for triplexes, um, including general conditions that would apply to all duplexes and triplexes, and as well as specific conditions that would apply specifically to triplexes within our proposal. And so you can't, again, you can't look at the use without looking at the proposed conditions too. And I think many of the conditions that Janet has been talking about are already proposed, maybe with some slightly different language, um, but may already be proposed within the current proposal. You have to look at two different boxes, the box under triplexes, um, and then the box under just duplexes before you even get to owner-occupied duplexes and all. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out with the triplex category, subdividable dwellings and converted dwellings are not the only way to build a triplex right now. Um, in fact, converted dwelling, you're you're converting a structure to a triplex um, that may, may be a single family or a duplex right now. Subdividable dwelling, as Chris said, has only been used once. I think it's meant for new buildings, but can be three, can be two, can be one at any one time, or can only be maybe two or one. It doesn't have to be able to house three. But you can also build the equivalent of a three-family unit through the townhouse provisions, which have almost no conditions. Yeah. Um, you can actually, if you page, if, if Pam pages up a little bit on what's being shown um, to the townhouse section, those are the only conditions in the, right there, uh, no, keep going up. 
um, farther yeah, <clears throat> farther up. Those are the only conditions in the bylaw right now for townhouses. This, mm -hmm. yeah, that it, it splits between two pages um, right now, and you can build a triplex with that. And then there are apartments. You can build a three-family unit with apartments, which also have very few conditions. Um, and so one of the things we're trying to do is add standard conditions to triplexes. Um, and then the other thing I would point out, because triplexes can be built as apartments or townhouses, the big difference between our proposed use table for triplexes and what is currently doable for triplexes is in the business districts. Actually, um, when, you know, in the BG, BL, and um, BVC, where right now you can put a three family under the apartment definition. Um, or under the townhouse definition. And we're actually proposing that you not be able to do that because of the status of what those districts are meant to be. So I, I didn't want any of that to get lost in this conversation. Okay, thanks, Andy Joe. Um, Janet, uh, it's just about eight, so. So, so you know, can I just, so Mandy Joe has kind of made the point I, I, I've been wanting to make is, you know, this is a really complicated zoning bylaw, and these changes make it more complicated. And we're not sure about the consequences. And I, I'm not, you know, so, you know, I would, I can't myself recommend this, you know, sea of changes. Um, I don't think it matches or implements the master plan. But I do appreciate what Mandy Joe just said, which is, you know, I keep on thinking like treat like things like you know, multifamily housing doesn't matter if it's a three unit apartment, a three unit townhouse, a three unit converted dwelling, a sub three unit subdividable dwelling, a triplex, um, even a duplex. It's like, you know, multifamily housing has very positive impacts and very negative impacts. Um, let's, let's treat those multifamily things in a very consistent way. You know, notice to abutters, um, consistent management plans, design, consistent design plans, you know, landscaping plans. I say, let's have one consistent decision maker for these things. The ZBA has been doing an excellent job. There's some really nice duplexes in South Amherst. And so they can apply these really consistently. Um, you know, and then we also have to address before we make all these, you know, it's like we have to address the issues around student housing, which is what we're waiting for from Bruce. And, um, so I just think that I, you know, I appreciate the effort in this, but I really do think we, my recommendation would be to the say to the town council, they have raised a whole host of issues and that have to be addressed. We need to simplify the bylaw, make it easier to build multifamily housing. So you don't need to hire a lawyer to go through what are you picking in this, you know, China, you know, like this menu of options. And I, I just think that it's, it, it's, I, it's worth the time for us as a planning department and a planning board to look at these issues like multifamily housing, where should it go, who should decide, and what are the conditions we want to see on it, and how do we guarantee that we are building the kind of housing we want, which is a mixture of di different kinds of people and eco you know, economic backgrounds and neighborhoods. So my recommendation is not to recommend this, but ask the town council to refer this issue back to the planning board and the planning department I would work on this for a year, you know, just to make it simpler. And so we don't have this use table that it's just Byzantine. Okay, Janet, thank you. That might be my last statement here. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know you're not feeling well. So uh, board members, unless anybody objects, I'd like us to take a five minute break. The time now is 8.02. And if you, we come, when we come back at 8.07, we will suspend this hearing to deal with uh, some of the old business, the two items uh, under our agenda for old business. And then we will return to this discussion. All right, so please mute yourself, turn off your camera. And when you return, please at least turn on your camera so that we know you're back. Thank you.
All right, it's on my clock, it's 8.08. .08, so hoping folks are trickling back and we'll talk about something else for a little while and then come back to the zoning proposal. Chris, I cannot hear you if you just said something. I said it's cold in town hall tonight, so I'm zipping up my jacket. <laughs> oh, okay. It's getting cold here. Yep. It's supposed to be a cold night. Johanna's got a blanket. <laughs> I have one at my hands here, ready. You know what's uh, sad is it's a towel. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it works. I can donate some blankets for you. We have way too many. <laughs> have them, but none of them. Work Mine is well. legit. So, do you think this will like wreck all the flower, the apple blossoms? I do. Let's we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. Looks like we've got all the board members back, and uh, so. Chris, do we need to do any formal in terms of ending the hearing for a little while and dealing with this other stuff? I think you can announce that you're suspending the hearing at a certain time and um, to take up other business and then announce when you go back into the hearing. Okay. All right. So the time now is 10 after 8, and we're going to suspend the hearing on the zoning bylaw proposal uh, that we started some time ago this evening. And uh, we're going to move to uh, item four on our agenda, which is old business. There are two topics under that category. Um, both of them are uh, site plan reviews that we did back in 2021. And um, we wanted the applicant to come back to us and give us an update. So uh, we will now move to that the first of those two topics, the one at the Amherst Survival Center. And um, Pam, you please bring in whichever applicant is uh, associated with that first, mm -hmm. with the Amherst uh, Survival Center. Okay, so this is site plan review 2021-01 uh, for the Amherst Survival Center at 138 Sunderland Road in accordance with the site plan review. Decision condition number one, the applicant will update the planning board regarding the continued need for the 14 foot by 30 foot shed located on the parking lot of the Amherst Survival Center. All right, it looks like Sam Gurren has joined us as a panelist for this discussion. Um, welcome, Sam. And uh, I wondered if you could give us, uh, give us the update. Absolutely. Hi, folks. Thank you for having me. I hope I can provide a bit of a break from all the zoning fun. Uh, anyway, so the Amherst Survival Center is coming to the planning board to request, request an indefinite extension for our uh, parking lot shed. Um, for a bit of context, the structure was originally permitted through September 2nd, 2021, uh, set for a date after initial site review to return to the planning board, uh, where it was extended until March 2023 under the provision that we return to y'all for renewal if a further extension was needed. Uh, so unfortunately, demand for the center services continues to grow. Uh, and while the temporary structure permit was originally contextualized as a COVID safety measure, um, both for the initial issuance in 2020 and renewed surrounding concerns about Delta in 2021, uh, we at the center have found that its programmatic need has continued past the height of the pandemic. Uh, participation in the center in the past year has exceeded even peak COVID numbers and continues to grow month after month. And we simply wouldn't be able to maintain our current operational modes and programming without this temporary building, uh, which helps to evade congestion within the building proper, reduces wait times, and provides an outdoor low contact interface for those still needing higher COVID risk, risk mitigation. Uh, all while ensuring that the center's building has the capacity to maintain its expanded pantry grocery delivery programs and simply numbers of people served. Uh, so an indefinite extension provides the assurance that we need as a, as a staff, as community participants, 
uh, that the center will continue to operate without any reduction in services and selfishly so that we don't have to come back to you folks every couple of years to make the same task. But happy to provide any more information as well. Okay, thanks, Sam. So you're requesting an indefinite extension for the tent structure or for the shed rather. Um, Chris, are there any issues with a this structure becoming a more or less permanent structure uh, in regarding related to the zoning or to the uh, building code? Uh, was it does it need to be does it need a foundation, for instance, that it may not have or uh, that kind of thing? Are you aware of issues with that? I'm not aware of any issues and the building commissioner was the one who suggested this avenue rather than having the survival center come back every six months or whatever to um, have them come back once and ask for an indefinite extension. Um, he understands that they are um, contemplating an expansion of their existing building and um, he thought that this would be the best mechanism for um, dealing with their interim situation. So I didn't hear anything from him about um, issues or problems related to the shed. Mm -hmm. And and he was the one who suggested this as long as the planning board would go along with it. Okay. Um, and as a permanent structure uh, in terms of the site plan, is it permitted? Uh, you know, it's not within a setback of the pro from the property line or, um, you know, I, I can't think of any other ways in which it might be in violation, but uh, have you reviewed that? I don't believe it is with in any violation. It's on top of an existing um, parking lot, so it's mm -hmm. not increasing the lot coverage. It's way uh, far away from the property lines, so it's not um, in violation of setbacks it is the same impervious material or it is an impervious material similar to pavement so it's not causing increases increases in runoff um so i'm not aware of any issues other than the fact that it takes up i think it takes a, up a bank of parking so it itself takes up four parking spaces and then two additional parking spaces to the um north i believe are mm -hmm. also not able to be used because of people going in and out of the side of the shed so it does have an impact on parking mm -hmm. but um not as far as i know on anything else okay and have you been aware of any complaints from neighbors or anyone about the presence of this shed i'm not aware of any complaints okay um sam have you gotten any complaints we have not and we are taking operational needs operational routes to address uh parking by expanding hours but you know okay. making that shift in uh behavior takes time to affect so we're hopeful. okay thank you all right janet so i i was at the survival center i don't remember if it was this week or last week masked dropping something off and i um I got a quick tour from one of the staff members and, you know, they continue to have the seating for people, you know, for their lunch and also the kitchen. And then the free store is now a series of tables filled with bags of food that they now do the survival center delivers directly to people. And they're not planning on bringing the free store back in the back is a whole bunch of groceries on shelves that people can come, I think once or twice a month and pick what they want. And the shed was filled with food that is donated by the local, I think, supermarkets, including like lovely flowers. And so people, I was told, could go and pick up some extra items in addition to the other bags or after they eat, go do that. So it looked like they were like fully, you know, they were using every square foot. And also they, the staff members said they are serving a lot more people than they had. So I could see the need for this, the shed and hopefully... I'm not seeing the end of the deed for the shed at any point soon. Okay, great. So it sounds like you're in support of this uh, request for an indefinite extension. Bruce. Um, I, I echo 
Dan's comments. Uh, we live up near the area. I pass the building frequently. I haven't been in it recently, but uh, all the reports that my wife and I have read, and we're supporters of the food bank uh, of the survival center, uh, uh, are the same, uh, basically, as Janet reported. So yes, I think there's. Uh, um, we understand that there is a continuing need. Okay. Uh, board members, any other uh, comments? I think uh, if not, I think it's time that we get a motion for approval of the the indefinite extension of the approval to have this shed on the site. Bruce. So moved. All right, Tom. I'll second. All right, thank you. Any other discussion? All right, uh, I'm going to take one second here and just ask, are there any members of the public who are attending who would like to make a comment about this topic? OK, I don't see any hands raised from the public. And we'll, uh, unless anybody else from the board wants to say anything, we'll go right into our board vote. Um, all right, so Bruce, uh, a yay means you are approving the indefinite extension, and nay is opposing that. Uh, yes. All right, Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So six in favor, one absent. All right, Mr. Gurin, thank you very much for coming. And sounds like uh, we'll probably next see you when you have a proposed expansion of your facility. You were hoping. Thanks again for your time, folks. I thank might you. throw up sometime. OK, so the time now is 8.20, and we'll go to the second item on old business which is uh, from the Jones Library, SPR 2021-03 at 43 Amity Street. In accordance with SPR 2021-03, decision condition number one, the applicant will update the planning board regarding the continued need for the 14 foot by 40 foot tent erected on the front lawn of the Jones Library. Uh, Mr. Hicks Richards, thank you for joining us. I please give us the update. <laughs> yes, and uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, so, uh, just a little bit of history: the tent was originally uh, purchased and installed uh, when we reopened during COVID, and it was so that we could have outdoor programming and we could have groups together in a safer environment. Uh, and last year. Although the, our COVID restrictions had decreased, uh, we did ask for a permit renewal uh, from the building commissioner. We asked him via email and he approved the tent to remain for another year uh, because a lot of people were still not very comfortable in meeting in large groups. Uh, the children's department was using it for programming. The Friends of the Jones were using it for programming. Uh, it, it was actually used by quite a few people. The town hall, uh, several town hall people actually took use of the tent last year. Uh, so this year when I emailed Rob for a renewal of the tent, he suggested that I come to the committee. Uh, I know that I submitted a couple of letters, once from the, one from the Friends of the Jones and one from the Children's Department in support of having the tent this year uh, and why they need it. So I'm happy to answer any questions in regards to that. Uh, okay. Can you clarify? Are you requesting a, a, a an extension of a particular time? Uh, one year extension. One year it, extension. Yeah, so it would come down not in an November. Indefinite extension. Like Correct. Dealt with. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Just a one year. One year extension. Okay. Johanna. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just at the library yesterday and noticed the tent structure was there, but that it didn't have a canopy on it. Um, were you just waiting to put on the canopy until the permit was authorized or? 
Correct, correct. And we also uh, tend to wait until you know spring thaw and things like that, because if we put it up too soon, uh, we have to deal with mud and all other kinds of fun things. So we typically wait until May anyways, uh, but we were waiting for approval on this. Got it. Okay. Uh, any other questions from board members? Do we have any members of the public that wanted to make any comments on this? Okay. Uh, Janet. You know, when I'm when I'm in town, I feel like I've never seen any activities in that tent for a long time. And so um, and then there's just been polls. So I, I'm not quite sure I see the need the way I did for the previous um, the survival center. It just seems like to me, it's like an eyesore and I don't see that much programming going on. And it seems like the Jones itself has you know enough space inside of it and room. So I'm kind of not seeing the need. And I, I haven't seen the use, I guess, is I don't see the use and I don't really see the need. And I could see having a tent for the book sale because it's very prominent, but like that could be a, a weekend thing. I don't know if it needs to be up all summer. All right. Uh, George, do you have any comment about maybe how many hours a week it's getting used or something like that? Uh, well, I will say that the tent doesn't get used, you know, come mid-October uh, and then November we take we take the covering off of it, of course, and it doesn't get used again until uh, until May of the following year. So it's completely dormant during that period of time. But I will say the children's department uses it every week. When it is up, the children's department uses it every week for programming, at least once a week, sometimes more. And is that like each time they use it, is it for one hour or is it? like continuous after school until eight o'clock or? No, it, var it varies. It's typically one hour, two hour blocks, uh, typically morning programming for younger children. So maybe five to 10 hours a week. R approximately, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, what are the exact dates of the extension? I'm... Is this... I believe it would be, it would be, now through uh through through the month of october oh so this is really just during this seasonal correct when, correct. when it's warm enough and then uh, would you intend to, to fully dismantle it in october or well i know you've yeah. been leaving the frame up yeah we've been leaving the frame just because it's uh, we really don't have a place to store it and it's it's very time consuming to put the frame up uh but i mean our hopes are that we will be moving into temporary spaces and doing the jones expansion project so uh the plan is to take it down in its com in its entirety this fall okay all right so this would be a one year extension effective may 17th through May 17th of 2024. Is that true, Chris? I think George is asking for an extension through um, the end of October. Is that okay. correct, George? Yeah, I, I would be comfortable with that. That's, yeah. Okay. Well, we all know, you know, things don't always go the way we expect. So, uh, you know, I guess you can always come back in October when, if, if things change. Agreed. All right. So from May 17th to October 31st. So you can have your Halloween party there. And then you have to dismantle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, board members, any other uh, comments? If not, does anybody want to make a motion probably in favor of it so that a yes vote means yes, it can extend, and a no vote means no, it cannot? Bruce. Uh, you are muted. Yeah, I move to uh, allow the requested extension from May until November 31st. Um, uh, I thought we said October. Oh, October. oh, I thought you said November 30th. Uh, well, October 31st then. Okay, great. Tom? I will second that. All right, thanks, Tom. 
All right, so um, if any, no more hands. I don't see any hands anywhere. All right, uh, Bruce. I approve. Tom. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm I as well. That's six in favor, one absent. Thank you very much, George. Have a good Thank summer you. and enjoy the tent. Thank you very much. Okay. Doug, I'm going to go. So, but th see you guys later. Okay. I hope you feel better, Janet. Thank you. Thank you. So the time now is uh, 829 and we will now resume the public hearing that we had started earlier regarding Article 3, Article 4, Article 9, and Article 12, changes to these uh, articles, mostly related to multifamily housing, duplexes, triplexes, and townhouses, and a couple other categories. So we're now resuming that hearing. Bruce. Doug, do you think it'd be appropriate now to uh, ask for public comment? I mean, as a way of resuming? Sure, I'm happy. I, to I personally that. would uh, uh, like to hear what folks are thinking. Okay, right. All right. Um, yeah, we do have a couple of categories left. We haven't talked about townhouses at all. But uh, okay, so public public attendees, would anyone like to make a comment? I still see eight people in the uh, attendee list. Uh, there's a hand, Dorothy Pam. Let's bring Dorothy over. Remind us of your address and your and your name, Dorothy. Welcome. Hi, I'm Dorothy Pam from two two nine Amity Street. Um, I have to say that um, this zoning proposal is excessively confusing. And I really do not agree with your voting it up or down. Uh, to vote something that has put had so much work put into it down um, seems to be kind of cruel. But there are many, many aspects of it, which you have individually, uh, and sometimes as a group, said, well, this isn't clear, or I think we need more protection here and there. So either I recommend that you do as was suggested, I guess, by Janet, uh, refer it back to the planning department for detailed work. Uh, hopefully they've taken notes on the, um, I, I cannot even count how many hours have gone into this so far. And few of us can keep track of what has been said, yes, no, up or down. Um, <clears throat> and all of you have made valuable comments on specific aspects. Um, so I'm really thinking that voting it up or down would not be good. In terms of the public, you know, it's supposed to be transparent and whatever. Uh, most members of the public cannot keep track of this in any way. Um, <clears throat> no matter how many times we spend an evening listening in and maybe your supermen can do it, supermen and women that can do it. Um, there's a lot of things that are really difficult here. Uh, one of them is, you know, I heard at a meeting that I wasn't at that UMass <clears throat> admitted that they're have a demographic cliff coming up when there's become the fewer uh, young people of college age and a re reduction. And this right now, this the student demand for more and more housing is not forever. It is a temporary moment, a temporary blip. And that is one reason why the university does not want to build more housing. And by university, I mean, you know, the, the overall or not just our own UMass does not want to build more housing, but the thought of <clears throat> us accommodating um, that problem by the destruction of some of the most lovely residential neighborhoods by getting rid of greens, getting rid of trees um, and adding so much density that they'll probably never return some of the place to what they were. Um, it seems that the town of Amherst will bear all of the burden and will lose something that's very important. I mean, I just went in for a hospital test yesterday and the uh, young woman said, where do you live? I said, Amherst. She said, oh, I used to love Amherst. I used to love it, but I don't anymore. It's just not the same. And she started listing some of the things that some of us have been speaking about. So I think we have to be careful about losing something for a temporary blip. Um, 
And I, Janet was correct. It's not just the cost of building, but there's also the profit motive. Um, only developers can really do this. This is this um, building these dens densification is not something that most people, and certainly not people who are families and workforce housing, can afford to do. It takes outside money of somebody who expects to make a profit. Otherwise, why would they spend so much money? And right. profit thank, by thank having you. huge high rents. So I, I really feel that what you're doing here is crucial to the survival of Amherst as a town that people could actually love. So I hope that you take more time and more care and do not just vote up and down. Thank you. I, I assume you are speaking as a per private individual rather than as a I am a speaking as a homeowner. I am speaking as a resident of a block in the key, one of the key neighborhoods. I am speaking totally as myself, Dorothy Pam, who lives at 229 Amity Street, okay? And I have a huge backyard and I do not want to see it paved over. And I do not want to see the trees cut down like the plan for 98 fearing. That is to me a just sacrilege, okay? And we talk about- All right, I, I, I'm sorry, we've, we've hit the three minutes and I need to be fair. Just don't cut down our trees, thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there other members of the public that would like to make a comment at this time? Okay, all right. Um, members of the board, shall we continue our conversation? I think we had left, we had gotten through duplexes, triplexes. We touched on converted dwellings. Um, Bruce, I, at least what I see on your handout that was mailed to me in the packet um, had to do with should converted dwellings be allowed by site by special permit in the aquifer recharge protection areas of the outlying districts given the proposed conditions currently not allowed we have talked some about that i guess that leaves townhouses um let's see the townhouse work workflow or matrix here Looks like it has the primary change being in the RN townhouses would be allowed by special permit going from a no. And in the BG townhouses would be allowed by special permit going from site plan review. So making it slightly easier to do a townhouse in the RN and slightly harder to do it in the BG. And then under the language, all right, so under the language that's now in the zoning bylaw. I'm just seeing a couple of minor changes to go from uh, the text that read permit granting board or special permit granting authority to simplify that to permit granting authority. And that probably was done because the zoning board really, or the planning board really isn't involved. Uh, it's all zoning board because it's all special permits for townhouses. All right, um, Chris, uh, how does the planning department feel about that? Um, did you have any particular comments about, about townhouses or not? I do not have any comments about townhouses. Okay. All right, uh, board members, I wondered how you felt about that. Um, you know, I probably would have the same concern about a townhouse in the aquifer recharge district. So I would probably keep a no in parenthesis on the RN category. Um, I don't think there are any, if there's any part of, of the uh, RVC that has aquifer recharge district. So we wouldn't change that. 
All right. So has everybody run out of energy to talk about this tonight? I'm I'm just, uh, try, you know, I feel like I'm trying to fill in during an election waiting for some more results to come in. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, talk to me. Okay. Um, this, this, the, um, The RN district moving from a node to a special permit seems to be the the the, the significant uh, uh, um, change here. The RN districts is fairly extensive, uh, and it ranges pretty widely from stuff that's pretty close in, um, bordering on village centres and so forth, and uh, and 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 the, and the general residents who being fairly outlying. Um, and this one is is for me quite difficult because I it's I would this 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 in particular I would uh, um, be inclined to ask uh, to to refer to the to the planning department and uh, or refer to the boards to refer to the planning department so that some kind of uh, assessment uh, or study could be made. Um, uh, it's I, because I am, you know, as, speaking as an architect, I can, uh, I'm not afraid of uh, um, multi-family uh, townhouse buildings. I think they can be quite nice. But uh, in other words, if I was designing them, but um, recognizing that um, frequently I'm not asked to do this kind of work or neither of my colleagues professionally. And so um, buildings that could be, um, uh, structures that can be uh, uh, have a scale of eight to ten buildings uh, can have a significant presence, and it seems to me that uh, the benefit of, of professional design is uh, really rather important. But I, I I doubt that we can obligate uh, a developer to um, have a professional designer, and even if we did, there's you know there's a number of my professional colleagues who was design judgments I wouldn't trust and so that's not going to solve the problem either <laughs> so I think that this one I just don't know that uh, I can support because I'm not brave enough I I, I think that uh, th there are too many moving parts here I don't understand the full extent of the RN enough uh, I could put in the time to do that but I would rather have somebody who's uh, got uh, better resources than I can bring to bear, more professional planning experience than I have, and uh, I guess probably more time as well. And I'd like to rely on professional counsel before I would support this one. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, you, you have kind of reminded me of something that went through my head when we heard from Dorothy Pam. Uh, so Chris, um, are we not obligated as a board to vote this in some form up or down? Uh, this came as a formal referral from town council to us. And I, I don't think we have the option or I don't know that we have the option to not act. I think you need to act. Um, you need to recommend it in, in its entirety or in part or not recommend it in its entirety or in part. On the other hand, you could recommend that it be referred to someone or some entity. Um, so those are some of your choices. You do need to make a recommendation, although, well, so all of those choices. But what I would suggest for tonight is that you also have hearing about the lighting policy on your agenda. Yeah. So it makes sense to me to, end the discussion tonight and pick it up um, maybe on June 21st or maybe, well, yeah, June 21st. The next time um, is that's the next time I'll be around to listen to this. Um, June 7th, I'll be out of town. And I think that having, you know, Janet and Andrew's voices um, to discuss this is important. And converted dwelling and subdividable dwelling are both very complicated. So I think at this time of night with people kind of 
maybe losing focus. I know I'm losing focus. Um, it may be best to continue this public hearing to a date certain and take it up again at a future okay. time. All right. Well, um, I looks like Tom's got his hand up. We'll hear from him. And in the meantime, maybe Chris or Pam, if you could find a date or a time certain on June 21st that you would recommend, and we'll come back to that. Uh, Tom. Sure, I can pass. I mean, if we're going to continue this conversation, I, I don't mean to open up another can of worms, but oh, I was going to say, generally Tom. speaking, I'm not. I'm not necessarily against townhouses and I'm not against them with special permit as I can um, imagine the kind of scrutiny that they would have um, in putting these into these various district or uh, zones. So um, I don't necessarily have a hang up with this, but again, the problem is if we're voting the whole thing, it's a good yep. point. In, How does that. it all balance out? Yeah. Well, I will say that, you know, part of the, one of the results of this discussion about this proposal for me has been that I'm not really happy, especially with the RN district and how it's laid out. Um, you know, if, if I were allowed to say, well, let's just scrap this for the moment and start over and find the best, you know, find some things we wanna really drill down on that come out of this conversation. Uh, I, think, I think the RN district needs some review and maybe some changes. Um, so, okay. So uh, board members, how do you feel about uh, ending the conversation for tonight and continuing to uh, June, 20, June 21st? Wow, we're already into June. Um, and uh, Pam, did you or Chris think of a time? Have we got anything on the agenda yet? You will have something on the agenda, um, and it's probably Eversource and their um, property on College Street, where Emerse Media used to be. They're extending their structure there, and so they are hoping to have a public hearing that night. But if that public hearing starts at um, 635, my guess is you could get through that in an hour. So you might want to put this on for um, 730 okay. and to get, it, get to it by 730. Yeah, uh, you don't think there's any chance it would go faster, and if we put 7:15, we can always be late. Oh, you could possibly do that. Yep. Well, maybe in the summer people will want to talk less and be outside more, so things will go faster. Uh, Mandy, Joe, how are you feeling about us continuing? So I obviously I'm fine with the continuance. I just wanted to let the board know that if it's continued to the 21st of June, I may not be able to come because I have a conflict, um, another dress rehearsal that night. So um, I don't think I can make it that night. I do, I do not know whether Pat could. Obviously, we're not necessarily um, uh, in, needed for these conversations since you're deliberating, but I did want to inform you that um, as you're making that decision. Okay, thank you. Well, I think I personally at least would like to kind of keep this conversation moving so that we eventually finish it. <laughs> um, so, you know, having to skip it on June 7th seems unfortunate, but we do need Chris. Uh, she's pretty essential for these conversations. So I would support the June 21st continuation. Bruce. Well, I can say so moved, uh, moved to continue the. Uh... Okay hearing until uh, 7.15 on June uh, 21st. 21st. Thank you, Bruce. And Tom, you've been doing our seconds tonight. Again. Thank you. All right, board members, um, we'll do a quick vote for that. Move to continue to June 21st at 7.15. Bruce. Aye. All right, thank you, Tom. I, uh, I'm an I. Jan, our Janet has departed. Johanna, right. And Karen. I. Okay, thank you, Karen. Okay, time now is eight forty-seven. We can go on to the next item on our agenda. Let's see. 
All right. Um, so just to make sure we check all the boxes on the agenda, Chris, uh, the third item under old business was topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Uh, do we have any items? I see you shaking your head. No now. topics, no. Okay, the time now is 848, if I didn't say that a moment ago. Uh, moving on to new business, Amherst Streetlight Policy, as proposed by Anna Devlin Gauthier and Manny Jo Haneke. Uh, welcome to you both. And uh, tell us what you want to tell us. I, I suppose I should ask if there's any, uh, uh, you know, recusals or whatever it was called. Disclosures? Uh, by the, any disclosures by the board, yeah. Anybody who's got part ownership in a street light company or something like that. Not seeing any. All right, Mandy, Joe, and Anna, please go ahead. Anna, would you like to start? No, go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I don't think we're going to go through the presentation that we asked to be included in the packet. It is late. Um, the The goal is so the current streetlight policy, um, and 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 I guess what I'll frame is the larger the larger potential plan here. Um, zoning does a lot with lighting. You don't have a specific lighting section per se, but you talk about lighting a lot. I've been in meetings with site planners reviews where lighting's talked about. There's a little bit of mention of dark sky compliance. Um, the CBA and special permits talks about lighting a lot. And then we have all these street lights. So there's a lot of private lighting and there's a lot of public lighting. And all of that lighting can cause um, trespass. It can cause pollution. It can cause all sorts of things. Um, and so Anna and I were looking at trying to update the lighting policies in town. And we are starting with the street light policy. It is um, a policy within now the purview of the council. Um, does not involve zoning at all because it is a policy of public way street lights. Uh, but the whole ultimate goal would be if, if this is adopted by the council as an update to the street light policy, which has not been updated since 2003, I believe. Um, we would then hope be hopeful of figuring out a way to propose some sort of zoning that would match the street lighting specifications. Um, and we're starting with spe specifications in terms of um, what color temperature, um, light trespass, down lighting, fully shielding, all these things. Um, as, as a hope of fully reducing the um, the uplighting, the light trespass, and the light pollution that we have in town. Um, because the scientific evidence out there is that these various things about light trespass and the color temperature and all of that harms not only human health, but other animal health um, can actually create more dangerous situations um, instead of less dangerous situations can be more unsafe. Um, and so we're hoping to start with the streetlights and then update to the rest of the town for other things. Um, so we're in the discussion process with the streetlights right now. The The main part of it right now is, is specifications of streetlights to require full shielding of all streetlights, um, to require no uplighting of all streetlights. So we're trying to reduce glare. We're, we're trying to reduce uplight in terms of the light pollution into the sky, the sky glow, um, and then light trespassing to ensure that our streetlights only light the parts of the street and public way we want so that they do not light private um, residential and commercial properties, that they stop at the property line. Um, so it's been through a lot of various configurations <laughs> since we proposed it. Um, and, and we're now sitting with, instead of a complete um, repeal and replace, a modification of the current bylaw, the current policy, um, and an addition of an appendix that would include all of these um, dark sky compliant and proposed uh, specifications to it. We have removed all proposals related to the change in where street lights go because that we initially started with one um, and that we realized very quickly got very complicated, very 
quickly in terms of locations and placements and all of that, in, as well as varying different views and that that would require a lot more outreach than necessarily the specification proposal. So we can answer questions about the specifications if you would like um, and, and how that might at this point, it would not affect any private parcels. I will say that we're, we're solely focused on streetlights. But if this is, you know, we didn't do these at the same time because we don't want things to conflict. Um, and so if we were working on a streetlight policy at the same time, we were potentially working on zoning bylaw changes um, that adopted them, we might end up with conflicting specifications and we really don't want that. Um, so your input uh, into dark sky stuff specifications and all of that um, would be great. Most of our special specifications came from um, the International Dark Sky, I don't think it's Society, Association, um, uh, their model bylaw, um, if you're curious where we got them. So yeah, and Anna can add anything else yeah. I missed. The only thing that I want to add is that when when we talk about a repeal and a place replace in a policy, we're also not suggesting that this be a mass um, replacement of all streetlights at the same time. So just as a consideration, this is a this is something that would be phased in as our current lights um, die. So uh, I wanted to make sure folks knew we weren't undergoing a massive massive uh, project and undertaking here. Um, but other than that, Mandy Mandy covered it all, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, well, I know I have some questions, but Chris, will you get your hand up? Yep, I just wanted to um, say that I invited Mandy and, and Anna to present this to the planning board because the planning board does occasionally have to do with um, streetlights. When you approve uh, a subdivision, um, you make decisions about where streetlights are going to go. When you approve a site plan review project you often look at ambient light that's um, available from street lights and you judge the light that is going to be added um, on the site based on what might all already be available from ambient street lights and um, some of your projects are very close into the right-of-way such as projects that you deal with downtown which would definitely um, be impacted or have an impact from uh, a streetlight policy. So I wanted you to be aware of this policy. And then if you have comments or want to discuss it, you have an opportunity to do that. But I, I just felt like it was important to um, have this presented to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, Mandy, you made some reference to it being a late hour. Um, and uh, for, for us, this is not a late hour. <laughs> Uh, although I wouldn't uh, argue if we wanted to stop. Um, if Do you want comments in this meeting or if we email you or Chris comments that she forwards to you uh, and questions, is that the kind of, is that adequate or would you want to have a discussion this evening? Uh, a full discussion, comments and all is perfectly fine tonight. I don't know when the planning board normally ends their meetings. Um, Anna and I regularly have council meetings that go well, well past this. So mm -hmm. we're happy to stay as long as the planning board would like to stay. Okay. All right. So board members, uh, any objection to having a discussion on this for, let's say, at least a half an hour? Okay. All right. Um, so I'll open it up for, to people who have questions and comments. I, I, I did say I had some, but I'm happy to wait. Uh, Johanna. I have just one question about the phasing it in approach. Um, if we do it, does it add incremental costs to phase it in as opposed to just changing all the fixtures at once? It's a really good question. Um, and that's one that we don't necessarily, unless Mandy has magically done homework that I have not done yet. Um, we don't know the answer quite yet. We have some baseline pricing understanding, but um, we would need to look into that further. Um, my understanding is, is that it, it wouldn't necessarily be the most efficient option because we have a, probably about 10 years left on some of our, on, on many of our streetlights. Um, and so it, we may be able to batch it a little bit, but um, it wouldn't be necessarily phasing. It wouldn't be necessarily phasing one by one in terms of like purchasing uh, equipment, it's possible that we would purchase it and install as as things die. Mandy, anything to add? 
Yeah, I would just add that uh, the council has been very um, concerned about the costs. And since our current LED streetlights, um, while not compliant with dark sky and anything here, um, are at least somewhat efficient. And they have, as as Anna said, about 10 years left. And so one of the things we've been thinking about is get this policy in place. And then when we do the relamping of the whole town, that would be sort of the, the last date everything gets done. But um, to give an example, if this policy gets in place earlier, uh, the council just had a, a hearing for polls, um, but actually underground things that might underground a lot of um, utility poles on College Street, which would remove all of the lighting that's on those utility poles on College Street. And so we might need to be purchasing new lighting. So that, um, you know, would be a, a place where we'd get a batch of stuff in like this. Um, the goal is sort of to minimize the additional cost to the town versus what we would already be doing to just replace the streetlights as it were. Great. Um, okay, so I think what I'll do is I'll, I'm just gonna read, I'm just gonna give you like five or six different comments. I don't need you to answer them, but, uh, you know, this is just feedback in terms of things that occurred to me as I looked through it. Uh, the first was, what does the DPW think of this? And I hope you've already talked to them. Uh, the second one was uh, at the bottom of page four, where you talk about the warmest possible color temperature. Um, hey, you know, I've seen red lights you know, if you go down in a submarine, everything is red. Uh, I don't think that's what we want. So that phrase kind of bothered me in terms of, you know, if some fixture is, is available in a really warm temperature that's beyond the, you know, something would people would consider white, um, that that's questionable. Um, under, on page five, item four, I guess it's 4B. Um, there's a couple of references to normal illuminance levels, which I don't think is ever defined. Uh, under On the same page, under um, maintenance standards, um, uh, item D1, uh, you're talking about maintaining on a website an official map of the location and all the details about the streetlights. Uh, I hope you're talking about the potential staff time to maintain that database. Um, I know that I have found that just because you could keep track of something, you don't always have the resources to do it. Um, under D2, uh, in the very last line, you you use the phrase burnt out. Um, since this is not actually burning, I think you should use the word inoperative. And then on the last page, actually this the last comment I had was about the 10 year period. And I didn't, I didn't think LEDs really had any end date, you know, that they would last for decades. Although I, at least the early ones used to have a color shift. So, you know, I wasn't sure whether you were actually accelerating the replacement by specifying 10 years. And it sounds like that's not the case. So those were what occurred to me. Um, I think at some point in the past, we have had a conversation, maybe it was just you and me, Mandy Joe, about when, what we would do as a planning board uh, about lighting and to, to and, and I know at that time I expressed some concern that we not make the bylaws for private citizens so technically demanding that they're not able to comply without hiring a lighting designer or you know being at the mercy of the lighting industry, which is a notoriously fickle industry. Those, Doug, were my, those were my comments. Doug, I think I got some of those and I bet Mandy got even more, but were those written down and would you be able to send them to us? 
uh, I can send you an email with the gist of them. Yes. That would be really helpful. I, I do think I got most of them, but it would be really helpful if you, they were, there were some specific. I guess, they, I guess they've also been recorded. Oh, true. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> okay, uh, Johanna. Sorry, toggling between tabs. Um, thank you for your detailed attention, Doug. I was wondering, it's possible that we just want to specify the range of Kelvins in terms of the color. Yeah. Um, and for, I was just looking at the- I think there was a target of 3,500 Kelvin uh, in there, but you know, it, 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 it did have some other language that suggested it might vary. So we had a 2,700 max in there that has actually changed since our original proposal. Um, but you know, it's the, the, the presentation had some language regarding the original proposal. So that might be what was confusing the current. And, and we just didn't change that because it was like the only thing in this presentation that was kind of out of date. Um, um, the current proposal is a max of 2,700 Kelvin for all lighting in town. Um, it used to be 2,700 for streetscape and 2,200 for other lighting. So the non the non downtown business district sort of area. And yeah. the feedback we got actually from the DPW was that that 2200 Kelvin is a lot more expensive of a light to um, source right now than 2700, because the 2200 is a special order at this time. And so we've changed the policy up to that 2700 that is likely not the special order from what we've been told, um, so that it would be a much more um, fiscally feasible um, and cost efficient light that's still on that warm warm side um so yeah okay that's great anything else johanna okay uh i i did want to ask you included a i guess a sort of product information from spec lines and um i guess i was just wondering does that mean this is the only supplier or why was this included Um, so one of the reasons it was included is we've had a lot of questions in TSO about what do these look like um, and what's possible. Um, uh, what, so we, what does TSO? Oh, our town services and outreach. It's the committee of the council that is hearing and and discussing and deliberating on the current proposal for streetlight for the streetlight policy. Um, and so we thought we'd include, I, I'm not even sure it's our supplier in town, but we thought it, it gave the tops field example of a full retrofit, but it also gave a lot of cool things that street lighting can do, especially as to solar powering and all. And so we just thought it was a, a good introduction to what is fully shielded. What do they look like? Um, what does downlighting look like? Can they be done in historical sort of, or, you know, that type of way that we do sometimes use in town? Um, it's not the only supplier. I think I've got three or four other <laughs> supplier brochures from a, um, a municipal conference from this year. So it's just gives you an idea of things that might be possible. Okay, great. Bruce. Um, I, I think this is a, a very good thing to be doing. Um, and uh, I confess that I didn't see this in the packet, so I didn't read it. Um, I have had it up for the last uh, 20 minutes, so I've kind of read it. But uh, I'll, I'll do what Doug did and, uh, and, uh, and see if there are any other things. He seems to have done a pretty good job, but I, uh, I'll do... I'll, I'll have a look and, and but I, I'll have to do it later and send you in any comment, any additional comments by email. But uh, thank you for doing this. It uh, seems to be a, a very positive step. Appreciate any comments that you have. Thank you. Um, as you get into this, is there an aesthetic decision about, you know, are we going to go with the retro? you know, retro look that, that from the 1950s, or are we gonna go with the circa 2023, you know, crush uh, brushed aluminum with very angular reflectors? And, you know, how, how does that decision get made? 
You want to try that, Anna? <laughs> I don't. I really don't. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try it. I'll try it. So, so our policy itself does not um, set forth any of those style um, design type standards in that sense. It it really talks about where the light can go and what color it is. Um, and obviously, some of that comes with some design guidelines, but. Um, there are policies out there and, and model bylaws that would discuss some of that. We have not taken that stance. Um, I, I don't know how the town does it now. I assume that process would continue as to how, how DPW decides which ones to put in now in terms of look. But um, the policy that we're proposing doesn't specify that the, that sort of fixture decade or <laughs> or or look well you know i i mean having worked on projects that had exterior lighting that 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 can be an aesthetic decision um it always has cost implications and you know that probably drives what's happening and, I, and it and my impression of when we've when the leds were put on the street light across from my house you know the the pole didn't change the arm didn't change it was just the head and um maybe that's the way it'll continue so there will be some shifts from that um doug if you think about uh if you look at our some of our current streetscape lighting there's no shielding whatsoever and so but one of the reasons why we were trying to put together the samples for tso was to show that there are options to match, for example, a historic looking lighting light fixtures while still having full shielding. Um, and so while that while the particulars of an aesthetic decision are not in this policy, the um, intentionally, I think I, I think Mandy and I have great taste, but I also do not think we should be the two people saying what streetlights should go in um, aesthetically. But I think that we what we wanted to demonstrate was that you can still match the the style of a neighborhood or of you know for example the streetscape lighting um, while meeting the the requirements of the policy. Um, that was one of the goals that we had in, in putting those examples in. So yes, some of the fixtures would need to look different because many of our fixtures are not compliant with this. Even if the bulbs change, the fixtures would need to shift. Okay. So Chris, I'll get to you in a moment. I have one other question, which is, are, have you, do you fear or have you already gotten any negative feedback from private property owners who are, who will be unhappy if your streetlights no longer illuminate my property? So Mandy, do you want me to, I, I'm, I can take I'm that trying, one. I, I can first <laughs> All right. So, you know, I think at first we heard a lot of concerns from property owners when we were still including, um, when, when there was a section that was proposing actually removing certain streetlights. When we took that out, we've, we've had to work really hard at communicating to folks that we are not proposing to remove streetlights right now. Um, and once we've explained that, I, I personally have not had the complaints regarding um regarding the you know streetlights outside of a home continue um there one of the one of the um it's the plural of impetus anyway one of the reasons why we were working on this originally was from residents who were um, having issues with streetlights flooding into their bedrooms for example um so so no we have not heard i or at least i will speak for myself I have not heard specific complaints regarding people worried about the loss of actual light onto their property. Um, I think people were more concerned when we were talking about actually shifting lights away from certain areas in town. Um, so I've heard some on each side. I've heard a lot of people that have come to me and said, I would love that light to finally be shielded. Thank you for proposing that street light to be shielded. Thank you. You know, I've heard a, a, a number of those. And then I've heard the occasional, but I use that street light to walk to my mailbox at night. Um, so there, there are a couple, you know, there are some people that are concerned because they're actually taking advantage of the, um, the light trespass onto private property to navigate their own private property at night mm -hmm. um but there are you know so i think it goes with anything in terms of that trespass and the light levels in general or the the sighting that we had at one point when we were proposing rules on where street lights would go there was a lot of 
we want less and we want more. Um, and so this is, I think, similar, but we've been to uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee and their biggest concern is locations, um, not the specifications we've put down and including not the um, the shielding that would stop light trespass onto private properties. And uh, we were also at the DAAC, the Disability Access Advisory Committee, and they were supportive of the specifications. They also had concerns about locations, but we've removed that because we realized we needed so much more outwork, outreach if we were going to try and do location. Great. Chris, you had your hand up for a while. Did we pass you by? I just wanted to say in answer to a question that happened a while ago that um, for downtown streetlights, I think the design review board would get involved. They got involved when the current downtown streetlights, particularly the ones with the um, kind of hat-like uh, structure over the top that is a shield, um, were chosen. They worked with the DPW and the uh, planning department to choose those lights. So they would probably be involved, at least for the downtown. Okay, great. Do we do any any similar thing in the village centers yet? Not yet. We don't have design review over the village centers, although I think that would be a good idea. Okay. Great. Um, I'm not seeing any more board hands. Any members of the public, uh, anything you want to make a comment on about streetlights? Okay. All right, um, I guess, thank you for coming. Um, a couple of us at least will probably send some comments to Chris for her to forward to you guys. And um, let us know if you wanna consult us anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for coming. All right, uh, second item under new business. The time now actually is 9.15. Uh, topics not reasonably anticipated. Do we have any of those, Chris or Pam? I'm not aware of any. Okay. All right, we'll move on to item six, uh, Form A, a and r subdivision applications. No. Okay, ZBA applications. Uh, Pam, you are muted. Thank you. I did receive two transmittals today. Um, and the first one, I couldn't remember if we talked about 485 Pine Street, uh, which is a property in the RN district. They're tentatively going to go in front of the ZBA on June 8th. Um, they are requesting a special permit for a change of use. Currently, the building structure is a single family, but it is vacant. They are proposing um, a special permit for a converted dwelling, a two family converted dwelling. The first floor would be four bedrooms and one bath with a second floor of three bedrooms and one bath. All right, uh, board members, anybody particularly wanna hear about that? Doug, I think we we decided on this last time. Did we? Yes, we, we expressed the lack of interest. Right. We felt the zoning board was quite competent to tackle yeah. it by itself. Okay, thank you. And right. then the second one, um, this is for property located off of Southeast Street. It's in the RO and Aquifer Recharge Protection. It is a flag lot. Um, the special permit was, the original special permit was issued in 1974, and every couple of years it has to be renewed uh, because the building on this flag lot has not commenced. So the last time that it was renewed in 2021, it's going to go in front of the ZBA to be, uh, with a request to be renewed again. So that also is scheduled for June 8th. Okay. Um, so it doesn't really sound like there's a building for us to think about with that one. Not yet. And, um, sounds like you know, the flag lock is permitted by zoning. So 
Yes. Uh, I personally, I don't know why we would want to talk about that one. Anybody disagree? Okay, so we'll let that one go, Pam. Okay, and that's it. And I'll try not to tell you about them repeatedly at the next meeting. <laughs> well, some of us forget them. <laughs> Apparently, um, me too. <laughs> all right, so how about the SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Anything coming our way? Uh, yes, we do have the, um, the electric station, substation at um, College Street. And I think I've told you about that before. And that's going to be coming to you on, on June 21st, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so that's it. And so we'll move on to the next item. And uh, that's the planning board committee and liaison reports. Bruce, uh, anything you want to say about uh, PVPC? No, uh, uh, they meet quarterly and, uh, and I'll have something maybe next time. Okay. Andrew's not here for CPAC. Tom, DRB? No, we meet next week. Okay. Janet has left us. Uh, maybe Chris, if you have anything you know about on the solar bylaw working group. Yeah, we're yeah. slowly working our way through the bylaw and um, I think we're making good progress. And yeah, bit by bit, um, probably sometime in July, I will be bringing parts of that to you, if not some draft, so. Okay, and how about CRC? And CRC uh, has been working on the zoning amendment, um, although um, they didn't really talk about it too much at the last meeting, but I think they're planning to talk about it soon. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the date of their continued meeting. Okay. All right, so we're through committee and liaison reports. I, as a chair, once again, have no report. How about you, Chris? Any report from staff? My only report is that I'm going to miss the June 7th planning board meeting with great regret, but I will be in France. So oh, well. I won't miss have, it too have much. You, have, have you prepared a fun-filled agenda for us while you're gone? <laughs> um, Pam and Nate are in charge of giving you a fun-filled agenda that night. Right. And I'm not sure what that will include. Yeah, we have I'm, to talk I'm, about that. If we don't talk about duplexes, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> there may be a, a need to cancel that meeting, although we'll have to put our heads together here in the office and see if that's necessary. Okay. 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 All right, great. All right, so with that, actually, Bruce, you've got your hand up. You want to give us some parting words? Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask Chris about staff. I know that you've said that uh, you've taken one of the two positions and uh, run, uh, run them in. I'm, I'm wondering where, where you are with the second appointment. We still need a second person and the, um, the requisition is out there, but I need to reinvigorate it. So I haven't had time to do that, um, but I hope to do that soon because we still need another person here. We have Way more do, do you actually outreach to the planning and region to the the Department of Regional Planning at UMass? Because I they're just about to mint another crop of yeah. graduates. Yes, we do definitely. Okay. Um, so we can uh, get people from there who don't have much experience, like we we had Ben. And he was terrific. Um, and he just walked right in and could do everything immediately. Um, I think we're a little bit reluctant to take people with a lack of experience and would prefer, you know, at least a couple of years. And that's what um, our latest uh, addition, uh, Rob, has. He's got a, a couple of years and he's terrific. He's very energetic and really hit the ground running. Um, so, yes, we're still looking for people. So if you have any uh, people in mind, have them contact our HR department um, and we will be, as I said, reinvigorating that uh, requisition soon. Okay. All right, so time is 9.22 and uh, I guess we're done for tonight. Can you, so Thank we you. may see you on June 7th, but we're not sure. Good night. Otherwise, Chris, have a great time in France.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hoping I can remember some of my French. All right, mm -hmm. and, and happy Norwegian Independence Day. Thank you. <laughs> All right, good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Bye. Chris. Thanks, Pam. You're welcome. Bye. Stop recording.